What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to our next positional breakdown video for the 2024 NFL Draft. And today, look, I, I don't mean to be over dramatic or hyperbolic here, but we are talking about a wide receiver class here that I really think is not just special. We use that term a lot. I'm talking like generational. This group could go down as the best wide receiver class ever like seriously this group is absurd so i can't wait for this one i know you guys have been excited for this one thank you for your patience by the way it's been like two weeks since we've posted i've been diving into the film trying to get these player rankings up um, but we are here and now that the combine is behind us we are like pedal to the metal to the draft so make sure you are subscribed we're going to be getting through all of these position uh, positional breakdowns as we lead up to the draft please do hit that like button before we dive in as well and i do want to take just a second to let you know that if you want my thoughts on all of the wide receivers in this class we're going to be talking about 15 guys today because this group is is so deep and so special like i said uh, but i've got 29 players written up over on my patreon where you can get access to my draft guide we'll probably have close to 50 wide receivers fully graded and written up when we get to april's draft so you can get access to all of the wide receivers my write-ups updated every couple days on every position group in the draft plus exclusive draft content we just put up a liatu latu film room over there and in april we'll be doing a seven round mock draft for all 32 teams so if you enjoy my draft content you want to support my draft content and get even more of it that is today's plug head over to patreon.com slash that franchise guy and go check it out but let's get into it let's have some fun and with my 15th wide receiver, it is actually 14B in terms of rankings. He has the same overall grade for me as my 14A wide receiver. So little distinction there. But let's discuss Roman Wilson, the wide receiver out of Michigan, who really helped his stock down in Mobile for the Senior Bowl, was working DBs down there, was the guy that Quinion Mitchell, who was the top corner down there, was kind of calling out saying, Bring it on, Roman. Let's see what you got. And they were going neck and neck all practice. Roman got his. Quinion got his. And, you know, Roman Wilson coming out of the Senior Bowl was was getting, like, I, I want to say one of the top, like, draft guys put him in, like, the top 30 for a second. Then he was kind of flushed into the second round. So, like, he really got some major buzz after being kind of viewed as, like, maybe a third, fourth round guy heading into the Senior Bowl. And I'm not quite on board with him that early i'm gonna just be honest i really like roman wilson if this were last year's draft class i would say he stacks right up with like Jaden reed who i had a second to a third round grade on last year um, but in this draft class roman wilson finds himself down here at, at 15 but i really don't mean that as a shot at wilson man i have him comped to randall cobb and i think their play styles they're really just physical build and athleticism are extremely similar but cobb's a guy that has played as a steady, sturdy, reliable slot receiver in the league for for 10 plus years, I think that can really be Roman Wilson, man. He's a, a no-nonsense, good, not great athlete from the slot. He's not like Lad McConkey in this draft or even Ricky Pearsall or some of the other slot receivers in the league where he's gonna come out and dot you up with like crazy foot speed and incredible route running. Um, he's not really all that great after the catch. In fact, he only forced two missed tackles in his final season. And if anything, that's where I do want to see more from him and potentially what drops him down a little bit in this class. Um, but just super reliable hands. He's an efficient route runner. Like I said, he's not going to show that crazy juice and the incredible route running, but he's going to get to his landmark really quickly. He's got great acceleration. If you don't get your hands on him, he's going to threaten that 5 to 10 yard intermediate part of the field like that. And when he's making his cut, like I said, he's no nonsense. He'll plan his feet and go. If there's a guy on him, he's really good at those subtle push-offs that they're not going to call it on him because, you know, this isn't like Keon Coleman or Mike Evans where when they push off, the other guy's going to go flying. No, Roman Wilson's a smaller guy. He'll push off, create a little separation, and then he's really physical, sticking his arms out, coming down with contested catches kind of when he's running those horizontal routes. And I really think that's where he's going to live in the NFL is from the slot. He doesn't have a ton of experience beating press coverage. He doesn't really have the 
stride length and long speed, frankly, to truly stack on the outside. Um, that's much more about kind of the ability to press and get through some of these guys and some of the physical coverage he would see from bigger corners on the outside. Um, but I think that's all good and well. I think you're drafting him to um, defeat defenses from the slot. I think he can do that day one and do that for a long time. So for that to be the 15th wide receiver in a draft class, out the gate already, we are seeing how special this group is. Um, but then my 14A wide receiver here is a completely different player on and off the field. And he is, I would say, the biggest wild card in this draft class. And that's going to be Jermaine Burton out of Alabama. And Jermaine Burton has really second round tape in any draft class. And even in this draft class, which again, like we said with Wilson, that's saying a lot. He's got the high recruiting pedigree. He went to Georgia, transferred to Alabama. He's produced. He catches everything. He has the most secure pair of hands out of any of the guys in this draft class. The best drop rate or the lowest drop rate out of these top 15 wide receivers. He flashes really good routes. I'm not quite ready to say he's a great route runner. I would say he's a good one, but you can see plenty of snap crackle pop in those in those breaks. He can um, get get off of press outside. There's still plenty of room to grow there, um, but the long speed is really good. I think his long speed was even a little better than the 4.45, which nowadays uh, relative to what these guys are running, that's actually not crazy good. Um, it's solid, but nothing special. I think he runs a little bit faster than that on tape. In terms of his film, the one thing he's really lacking, I would say, would be the run after catch ability. He's a little bit more slender. He's going to go down on first contact. Not a ton of like creativity and juice when he's got the ball in his hands, um, but Really with Jermaine Burton, it's much more of an off-field thing, uh, and you'll see plenty of red on the screen here that really hurts his evaluation or at least adds question marks to it. There's just some very major maturity concerns with Jermaine Burton. Um, he struck a woman in frustration. I think it was the Tennessee game um, after they, I, I would assume they lost, um, but I think it was a reporter or a fan was on the field. Um, he hit her in the head. Uh, didn't look like an accident either. There's also mixed reports of his departure from Georgia, where he started his career, and at Alabama, of him kind of not really getting along with the coaches all the time. And then, you know, he's not at the Senior Bowl, which I don't want to speculate, but there's really no reason for Jermaine Burton, a fourth-year player who's in that sort of 10 to 12 range of wide receivers. There's really no reason for him to be at the Senior Bowl other than Jim Nagy didn't want him there. So maybe he had an injury that I don't know about, but I don't really think he did. So there's just a lot of sort of character maturity concerns with Jermaine Burton. And that's where it gets tough on someone like me that can only watch the film uh, and tell you what the grade is. I can tell you the film grade is second round tape, but if he falls to the fourth, fifth round and, you know, he's getting into these interviews and, and just not really looking like the professional that all of these other great wide receivers are, are really, um, you might see him fall into the fourth, fifth round. And then it's just a matter of can he grow up in the NFL? Can he, can he find a good home with a good coach that uh, can, can get the most out of him? really a polarizing potential uh, range of outcomes for this player right here, Jermaine Burton. But that upside is pretty fantastic. I think he can be a sort of one of three starter in the NFL because he can beat you in so many different ways from inside and out, uh, short, intermediate, and deep. Um, but let's get to my number 13 wide receiver. And God, I'm so excited to talk about Johnny Wilson here, my number 13 wide receiver in this draft. And with most of these guys, and I know we just talked about Jermaine Burton, um, but most of these guys, I have a pretty strong grasp on like who they're gonna be in the NFL, how their skill set's gonna translate, if they're gonna be good. I'm just gonna tell you right now, I have no freaking idea if Johnny Wilson's gonna be any good in the NFL because I, I have never evaluated a wide receiver like this. He is 6'6". 233 pounds as they say he's a Popeye's biscuit away from being a tight end and maybe that is in his future but I do think he's a wide receiver in the NFL um but again I don't know I've never seen a guy that moves like this he has the most unique movement skill set I've ever seen because he has these 
long strides that just eat up a ton of space. It's no surprise that he had a pretty good 40 time at his size because you watch his film and he pulls away from guys. He really does. He's he's a difficult physical specimen to keep up with for these corners. Um, but it's not just that. He actually has a very crafty, unique route running and release style that just kind of works for him. He's really good. I don't even know if it's just lower body explosiveness or core balance paired with agility or again, what it's tough to put true words to how he moves other than just showing you the film of him doing these things is probably the best way to do it. So I'm going to show you the film right now, but um, he does just kind of glide past these guys and he's a difficult player for corners to jam to get their hands on to stick with him down the field he does actually separate and in his own way he's actually a pretty good route runner you pair that with his catch radius which is obviously elite not only is he 6'6 but he has 35 inch arms the next guy down is over two inches less Additionally, he has a 37 inch vertical. So if you pair this guy with a accurate quarterback and not to throw Jordan Travis under the bus, he's an NFL caliber prospect. But if you pair him with a really accurate NFL quarterback that can just give him catchable balls, there's a chance that this guy's just unguardable. Now, that's all obviously very good. The highlights are fun and impressive. And this is maybe the most fun player on this list. But while there are plenty of times where he's able to shake these guys and run away from guys, there's also times where he does get kind of jammed, whether that's at the line of scrimmage or down the field. If he doesn't set himself up where he kind of gets that half step of space where he makes the most of it with those long strides, he has a hard time changing directions and accelerating into that top speed. You will see him getting locked up and really not creating a lot of separation at all. So when you go against NFL corners, are they going to be able to get him into that state much more often? It's certainly possible. The other thing is you do just wish with this skill set that he just had better hands. Now, I will say I was super impressed by his hands at the Senior Bowl. Don't think I saw a drop all week, but on film... He does have a career drop rate of 12.8%. And the last two years, it's still over 10% both years. So just the hands consistency, the focus to use his size, um, and even the contested catch percentage, 40% last year, 52% in 2022. That's much more of what you'd want it to be in the NFL. Um, but even just you know using that size to his best advantage, you want to see that a little bit more. So a truly unique prospect here. I'm just excited to see him get to the NFL and see if this works again. I would try him and fail him at wide receiver. And if it doesn't work out in the first couple of years, maybe use the second half of that rookie contract to put another 10 pounds on him and play him as more of a tight end. Um, but the last thing I will say is he's not just going to play on the outside. He's going to be a bit of a hybrid flex tight end anyway in his usage. Just as Florida State used him, he's really good over the middle of the field when linebackers try to match up on him safeties i mean slot corners usually are too small to just come even close to guarding him so he is a very unique chess piece gonna take a team kind of with the vision of how this guy is gonna work in the nfl but um really excited to to see him get there and and this is a guy i don't have a pro comp on again because i just he's so unique but do consider myself a johnny wilson fan as we move to my number 12 wide receiver here Debo Samuel, I mean, Malachi Corley, uh, a lot of people comparing Corley to Debo Samuel. And, um, you know, I, I, I do get it from a play style perspective. Like if you're going with that stylistic perspective, Malachi Corley is and should be used exactly like the 49ers use Debo Samuel. He wins in the exact same ways. In fact, his size is like very similar. He's built closer to a running back. Then a wide receiver, he's got better speed when the ball is in his hands than he does kind of in his routes. Um, and just like Debo, this dude is, is unstoppable after the catch because you're talking about taking basically a power back and just setting him up against 
180 pound corners that just can't wrap him up and he's got kind of the the lateral agility the juke moves the contact balance like he is really a nice player with the ball in his hands he's forced 55 missed tackles over the last two years that's crazy for a wide receiver and of course you can give him the ball on jet sweeps and screens and all that stuff um, but if all he's going to be is a manufactured touch guy, he's probably not a top 15 wide receiver in this class. He actually has a wide receiver skill set on top of that stuff. There's a reason he's not just a running back. In fact, I think they moved him from running back to wide receiver. He's actually a pretty good route runner. He's not amazing, right? Like he doesn't have incredible foot speed and he's newer to the position. So um, just doesn't quite have that polish, but he does set up his breaks really well. He's got some of that deceptive kind of shoulder shimmy um, before his breaks. And just like we talked about with Roman Wilson, he's he's even better, Malachi Corley, at leaning into the coverage and then using that sort of shove off. If he's running it out and in a dig, um, that kind of stuff, he will create separation at the top of his break with that without drawing penalties. So, um Again, very similar to Debo Samuel in terms of skill set, but I do think Debo is just a, a tick up in terms of athleticism, and I hate to compare guys quite to that level of player. But how about Rasheed Rice, who went to the Chiefs as more of an outside wide receiver at SMU and still played from the outside for the Chiefs, but did almost exactly the the usage stuff of a Debo Samuel for the Chiefs. Rasheed Rice was second behind only Debo Samuel in average depth of target. I think Malachi Corley can come in as a late second round pick, just like Rasheed Rice, get fed touches and put up really crazy production if he's put in the right, right situation where he's got space and run after catch opportunities. Um, the one area that I really wish we could see more from him, other than the route running and kind of how he's more limited to more of that playmaker role, but um, just his ability to catch the ball through contact, he shows it plenty of times, but not consistently enough. He only came down with four of his 17 contested catch targets this year, and only six out of 18 the year before that, a career contested catch rate of 26.5%. That's just not going to cut it when you're a guy that is going to be asked to run slants and digs where you have defenders draping all over you. He struggles with that a little bit more. You know, Debo Samuel in the NFL has been 43% on those types of targets. And that's why I can't quite go there with the Debo Samuel comp. Um, if he gets really good at that, maybe. But, uh, you know, Rasheed Rice was just one for six on contested catches last year for the Chiefs. So uh, I think a little bit more realistic there, even though Rasheed put up 1,000 yards plus for the Chiefs in his rookie year. But I like Corley a lot, uh, a little bit more of a flavor of the month type of pick. But if you want a uh, run after catch threat, a playmaker, and you've got a plan to get this guy in the ball, uh, get the ball in this guy's hands. I think late second, early third round, all the way for Malachi Corley. Then we've got a guy that is, um, I think, going to surprise a lot of people that he's not in my top 10 wide receivers. He's a guy that uh, is in a lot of people's top five and um, a, a common first round mock draft pick. And those that follow me on Twitter uh, know who this guy is going to be. But it's Troy Franklin out of Oregon. And, you know, I watched Troy Franklin. He was one of the first players I got to this draft season in January when I was getting through the quarterbacks, watching Bo Nix doing his receivers with him. And I really hadn't looked at consensus rankings or mock drafts or really anything. I was going in really blind at that point. And I wrote up Troy Franklin as a third round receiver with good, not great speed, a crafty route runner, and uh, a guy that is is a little bit undersized uh, or at least is, is lanky and struggles with uh, physical contact within his routes. If, if a guy can get his hands on Troy Franklin, he really can't pull away from him and run through contact. Uh, comes in and weighs at 176 at the combine. So that, I think, is, is very much there. Um, but, you know, I, I write him up and then... A week later, I'm seeing him in the first round of mock drafts. I'm like, whoa, really? And, and I had to revisit the tape to see if there was something I'm missing there. And, and I liked him a little bit more. But, um, you know, I just I really can't get there with Troy Franklin relative to the receivers that we still got to talk about here. I think he's a good prospect. I have him comped to Darius Slayton. I think he can be a starter in the NFL. Um, but for a guy at that size that 
really won a lot as a vertical threat at Oregon. I don't project him as some dominant deep threat. In fact, I watched his film before I knew any of this hype on him and had him projected at a 44240. He comes out and runs a 441. So at 176 pounds, when I see you getting disturbed by contact in his routes, um, I really think you need that elite speed to win in the NFL with that frame if you're just going to be a vertical threat. Um, and I just, I, I, again, I, I think he can win vertically, but I don't think he's going to do it super consistently in the NFL. And then you're talking about an undersized possession wide receiver who has a ton of drops on film, very inconsistent in terms of catching traffic because of that lack of play strength. So I, I do still like Troy Franklin I think he's draftable at like the end of the second round and one thing that I really like about him is that football awareness when Bo Nix started scrambling Troy Franklin was so good at kind of you know keeping his head on a swivel reading out the defense and finding that open space to work with Bo Nix in scramble drill so you know, I, I think you pair him with a Mahomes a Josh Allen type of quarterback at the end of the second round kind of put him in that Gabe Davis or MVS role where, again, I I think he can win vertically. I just don't think he's going to be like, like I've seen Deshaun Jackson comps on this guy, for example. He He's not that. But can he be Gabe Davis and take the top off from time to time? Yeah, I, I do think he can do that. Um, and then when those plays break down, that's where I really think Troy Franklin's at his best. So I just found him kind of getting pushed down the rankings a little bit here. If other people feel the way consensus seems to be leaning on Troy Franklin, I'm probably letting someone else take him in favor of some of these other awesome top 10 guys that we're about to talk about here. Um, but it's not to say he can't become a starter, because if you're ranked 11th in this class, you're still a damn good wide receiver prospect and uh, probably would have been around the top five last year, but that's not where we're at right now. So let's get into the top 10. And my number 10 wide receiver is Ricky Pearsall out of Florida. And he's a specific guy that kind of leads me to push back on the Troy Franklin hype because I think he does everything Troy Franklin does as a deep threat, but better. I think he's an even better route runner, has better release at the line of scrimmage. I think it was equally as fast and he's got much better hands. He made the catch of the decade in college football against Charlotte, where he's it's basically the Odell Beckham catch, but he gets pegged in the chest right after. It's insane. Um, now, he's not always making those catches down the field, but I do think he showed better ball skills um, than Franklin. Now, he's not quite as tall, but again, I just don't think it is a big enough difference to matter. The big difference with Pearsall, though, is he is such a dynamic athlete in the short to intermediate game. If Lad McConkey didn't exist, he'd maybe be the best route runner in this draft class. The way he sets guys up, he's got a cerebral approach at the position. He is a fifth year player, so he's had more time to develop that, but he's developed it, right? Like you're hoping some of these younger guys like Troy Franklin, maybe Xavier Worthy, you're hoping they get to the NFL and in two years, they turn into the route runners that Ricky Pearsall is. But Pearsall's there, right? Like, he is going to be, I don't know, a top, let's just play it safe and say 25 to 30 route runner in the NFL the day he gets drafted. Like, he is that smooth with it. And it's to all three levels, double moves, in-breakers in the intermediate game, whip routes underneath. It's, it's all there with him. Now, like uh, Franklin, which I didn't mention, he's he's a little more slender, so he's not the best run after catch threat. He's usually going to go down uh, on first contact, but um, I I think he's a little more shifty than a than a Troy Franklin. So this one really was pretty easy for me to slide him above Troy Franklin. I think if you miss out on Pearsall, you can take Franklin and be pretty happy about it. But for me, he's he's just way ahead of the curve and is a is a better athlete like his he had a 6643 cone a 405 shuttle this dude is freaky athletic we saw it on display at the senior bowl where he was he was right there next to roman wilson and lad mcconkey in terms of just dominating corners all week he had a great final year at florida um, he doesn't have the drop issues that troy franklin has and some of the other wide receivers in this class i don't want to just tear down troy franklin but um, these guys are back to back so it's only natural um but 
man, he's he's really nice. I've got him comped to Jerry Judy, and it's not a perfect comp, but just the way he moves, the way he runs routes, the way he can make spectacular catches, even though he's not like super consistent with it. I would argue Judy's a little bit more fluid in terms of athletic quickness, whereas Pearsall has more consistent hands in terms of the drops. Um, but I think in terms of role in the NFL and play style, you're talking about a guy you can put inside and out, can stack guys vertical and just shake dudes in the short to intermediate game and be that route runner archetype that you move all over the field and scheme up open looks for your for your quarterback. So big fan of Ricky Pearsall, as are many people, but I, I do feel like he's a bit of a my guy in this draft, as is, I think, my number nine wide receiver, Xavier Leggett. And we're going from a couple of, you know, kind of speedier route running uh, types of receivers to a 6'1", 222-pound speed train down the field in Xavier Leggett. And, man, he's just a handful to deal with down the field. He's drawn a lot of DK Metcalf comps. He's not as big and imposing as DK Metcalf. So I didn't go quite with DK as the comp. But in terms of how you want to use him, very similar. I want him running slants, go balls, and comebackers, stop routes, and get the ball in his hands on screens because he's built and moves like a running back a lot of the times. Um, and that's something that he actually is probably a little better than DK Metcalf, and that's where the Demarius Thomas comparisons come in for me. Demarius Thomas, if you remember, was 6'3", 225 pounds, did a ton of damage in his best years catching those those bubble screens, those tunnel screens, uh, those kind of um, quick passes from Peyton Manning. Just get the ball in his hands and let him run uh, away from the defense. I think he can do a lot of that with Xavier Leggett. But the one thing about Leggett that I really like about him, and I think I'm a little bit higher on Leggett, probably not like a ton, like it's tough to watch his film and not like him, but uh, I will say I think he gets a little too much criticism for being a poor route runner, and I just straight up disagree. I actually think as a fifth-year player, even though he wasn't playing, he was getting better and learning how to run routes. Like He's actually one of the best receivers in the NFL on those stop routes, those comebackers where he can throttle down really well. And when you're talking about a guy in that DK Metcalf role where a lot of the times you're just going to be lining him up, asking him to go deep, if he can stop on a dime and keep corners honest um, to stay within range of those comebackers, that's only going to help complement both phases of running deep and running those intermediate games. And it's another reason I didn't go with DK Metcalf, because DK doesn't throttle down as well as Xavier Leggett. And on those go balls, by the way, Leggett was incredible. Also on deep posts, not just the speed to pull away from guys and force corners into that kind of like panicked recovery mode. But I mean, this dude has a 40 inch vertical jump, a, a 10 foot six broad jump. He showed in this breakout year of 2023, he'll he'll go up and get it, man. He had a contested catch rate of of uh, 48%, which is very very good. It's not like elite or anything, but his highlight catches uh, are spectacular, and that's where some of the DK Metcalf thoughts come in there. I really think his skill set can work in the NFL, and I also think he can he can stop and have some good foot speed to get. Um, going on those dig routes too, where he's just a really tough cover. So I know he's a fifth year player. I know he only had the one year of production, but um, not everybody develops at the same rate. And I really think he's clicked into place. And as long as he's used within that role and you kind of know what you're getting with him, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of stuff to nitpick in his game. Now, if you want him to come out and run the full route tree and be like your go-to read every single play, yeah, you're, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed in what he turns into. But again, is that kind of backside Z receiver running a, a more limited route tree? Love him. I think he can also step in and be a big slot for you too. And with Leggett, with Pearsall there, uh, I have these guys as top 50 players in this draft class. So every top 10 ranked wide receiver for me 
I think will make my top 50 big board when all is said and done. Uh, but let's get to my eighth ranked wide receiver, which is actually another uh, 7A, 7B situation. So my number eight or 7B ranked wide receiver is Keon Coleman, the wide receiver out of Florida State. We're sticking with some bigger bodies here. But with Coleman, I, I would say him, Jermaine Burton because of the off-field stuff, and Johnny Wilson because of his unique profile. Um I would say those are the three guys on this list that I'm I'm just not entirely sure if their skill set will for sure translate to success at the NFL level because um, Keon Coleman's just not that fast, man. He ran a 4.61 at the 40 time. That really wasn't all that surprising. You watch his film, and he just he doesn't really pull away from anybody, but he is kind of like these bigger wide receivers that have made it work in the NFL. Guys like Michael Thomas, maybe, or uh, Michael Pittman, which is my high-end comp for Coleman. Maybe a little bit of Drake London, though I think London is, uh, is, is particularly fluid for a bigger wide receiver. But the guys that are built like Keon Coleman that have made it work do have the same trait that Coleman has, and that is... In those breaks, he does show really good athleticism. He has um, good short area juice, if you will, and that's reflected in his 38-inch vertical jump. He had a good 10-yard split on his 40 time. He just couldn't sustain um, and build that speed, um, a 10-foot-7 broad jump. And when he ran the gauntlet drill, he actually had the fastest speed in terms of just the play speed kind of running a slant sort of um, catching the ball and running and I've always well I've, I've said recently with Michael Pittman kind of having that breakout year Michael Pittman's not a guy with great speed I, I can't remember if he ran or what he ran but you know four six is close-ish for Michael Pittman but when Pittman gets the ball in his hands or when he catches a slant he just he isn't thrown off of that top speed quickly and he even showed in the, the gauntlet drill at the combine where you're just running in a straight line catching uh, a bunch of passes he actually had the fastest play speed in that drill even though he ran the slowest 40 times so it was backed up by one of the more important drills at the combine so he is a really tough eval because yes there are the Pittmans and the drake london's and the michael thomas's that just aren't fast but are big and physical and good at their breaking points and good through the catch point and fast through the catch point but for every one of those there's an in keel harry right a kelvin benjamin a hakeem butler so there's always going to be that fear with a slower more um contested catch sort of big bodied slower x type like keon coleman but i do think there is a archetype with some of those names we've mentioned that can work for him and he's got that basketball background he's not just kind of physical through contact in his routes and at the catch point um, but he's really got amazing body control he elevates and attacks the football he can kind of hang in the air um, not just on like end zone fades where they used him a lot um, but you know on back shoulders and working the sideline there he showed really good timing with Jordan Travis on a lot of those routes and I'm gonna be honest I think his production like we said about Johnny Wilson would have been a lot better if Jordan Travis was an a, a consistent accurate NFL quarterback not to trash Travis but he's just he's just not as accurate as the quarterbacks that Keon Coleman will likely be catching passes from that's just the truth so if you can give him a well-placed back shoulder or a well-thrown fade or a well-thrown jump ball um, Keon Coleman's gonna make that 50-50 ball a 55-60 ball a lot of the time so I I'm right down the middle with Keon Coleman I think I've seen him as a top five wide wide receiver for some I've seen him outside of the top 10 for some he's my wide receiver eight I'm giving him a good chance to succeed, but if he's a bust, I think we've seen this type of player do that as well. So he would scare me a little bit, but I would also be excited if my team took him. And then we have my 7A wide receiver, who I think is a, a, a dangerous pick. I'm not going to quite say equally dangerous because I do have him ahead of 
Keon Coleman for a reason, but there are boom or bust aspects to our next player here, Xavier Worthy as well. Um, but his play style could literally not be any different here. You're talking about the slowest wide receiver in our top 15 and really the slowest wide receiver in the top 30 to the fastest wide receiver among those guys. Um, obviously broke the 40 yard dash record at the combine, 421 ridiculous speed and it's not just the speed he reminds me in terms of movement skills honestly and this is high praise but a name that you think of is Jalen Waddle where he's not just fast but his agility the foot speed the change of direction the stop start acceleration it's elite like there's a reason teams are thinking about Xavier Worthy in the first round because you just don't get this type of athlete every year. Now, while he ran a 4-2-1, he did do it at 165 pounds, which is a whole other six pounds lighter than what he played at at Texas. I, I think you're better off having him put six or seven pounds back on and have him running 4-2-5, 4-2-6 speed. Uh, if that makes sense, um, because honestly, when I watch him at Texas, I was a little surprised that he broke the 40 time record. Like I, I wasn't surprised that he was the fastest wide receiver in the draft or anything like that. But like, I don't think this guy has, let's just say 99 speed in Madden. Like I, I don't quite see that on film. I think he's more of a 96, 97 speed type of guy just based off the film there but i mean obviously the speed is real and and when you put him outside he can stack corners and win vertical there's no doubt about that if you throw him a crossing round he's gonna run away from you like you can definitely tap into that speed but what i was getting at was at that size he gets banged in his routes he gets slowed down if you're going against corners that have really good hand usage and most of the starting corners in the nfl are long corners with really good hand usage you can you can delay that speed and, and bang with him down the field, and he just really struggles to accelerate through contact. Not to mention, his contested catchability is just laughable. People make fun of his hands. I don't think he necessarily has bad hands. He's going to have drops being a vertical threat. It's just part of the territory. It's just harder to consistently come down with those balls, but I think he has good ball tracking, good hands. His drop rate actually isn't that bad. Um, but the contested catch rate and the ability, like if he has a corner, even just like getting a hand on his hip or if, if his, if his hip and hip or anything, the slightest amount of contact is going to redirect his arms, redirect his hands. And he's just not going to come down with it. And usually that's not going to get charted as a drop. Um, but Xavier Worthy in his final year at Texas, um, 23% contested catch rate. That's five out of 21 targets like that's a pretty big sample size too so there are issues with his game but man that athleticism plays in the nfl look at tank dell at 166 pounds didn't seem to bother him there's a lot of modern coaching practices that we're seeing now to use pre-snap motion and certain bunch formations and all this stuff like look at the dolphins what they're doing with tyree kill there's so many creative ways you can scheme these guys into space that teams are doing now that you weren't doing maybe five, six, seven years ago when like a John Ross came into the league, for example, who, who ended up being a bust. And he's a pretty good route runner too. Like you see the foot speed. I mentioned the, the fluid athletic ability. Um, he's he's not even 21 years old, old um, yet. He also, if you're one of these guys that's looking for that early breakout age, 20 or at 18 years old not even 18 i think he stepped into texas um, put up 981 yards 12 touchdowns actually had a 50 percent contested catch rate that year his best year was arguably um his his freshman year so i mean this guy's been doing it declaring as a true junior breaks the 40 yard dash record it's really hard not to get excited about um xavier worthy i've got him comp to marquise brown who i think is very similar in terms of athletic ability and slenderness and route running um and i know the last couple of years for marquise brown haven't been great but i mean he was retrade he was drafted in the first round and then retraded for a first round because of that vertical ability being something that's just not gonna come around every year so 
I do think someone is probably going to pull the trigger on him in the first round, and then it just comes down to obviously Worthy working on on some of the craft, but also just you know having a quarterback that can unlock that deep ball ability. You don't want this to be a uh, you know a, a, a Ty- Tyquan Thornton going to the Patriots with Mac Jones who can't utilize that deep threat ability. Uh, otherwise, you know why are you drafting this guy, right? So um, landing spot's going to matter for for him and all these guys. But uh, I am a I'm a Xavier Worthy believer tweeted a couple weeks ago that I just don't understand the idea that Troy Franklin is above Xavier Worthy, and I think after the combine, that's probably going to be a a more consensus opinion here. But let's get to my number six wide receiver. We don't have to go far here. We're staying at the University of Texas, Adonai Mitchell, and I was really bummed that I couldn't get Adonai Mitchell into the top five, but I would have been equally bummed if I had to exclude any of our top five guys. But I will say Mitchell comes in sixth because I think he is the riskiest of our remaining wide receiver prospects, the most bust potential. But at the same time, I I have the third highest potential grade on Adonai Mitchell in this draft, and he comes in as wide wide receiver six. So it comes down to what you're looking for. And I, I have him as one of three wide receivers in this draft Um, With that alpha tag, now he's alpha potential, whereas our top two wide receivers, I think, are just alphas. So Mitchell's got to get there. But let's start with, like, the good stuff before I kind of talk about the knocks and where we need to see him get to. But the thing you love about Mitchell and why I think his potential is so high is he's just such a rare mover at his size. And... I saw Brett Coleman kind of beat me to it. He made a great video about Adonai Mitchell, nailed the eval. Go check it out. Um, Brett, I think, did go as far as putting him in the top five for his his rankings. But um, the C.D. Lamb comp, I saw the same thing when I watched Adonai Mitchell, but I didn't go there because of something Brett pointed out and something that Mitchell has since talked about. He just doesn't play as fast as C.D. Lamb does. Lamb has the juice, man. Like, he can pull away from guys. And you watch Mitchell's tape. He doesn't really do that. But what has kind of come out is he said himself, Mitchell himself said, I don't run routes at full speed. He wants to kind of save his stamina for the whole game or something. And, And a lot of it, too, is just the way he kind of paces his routes and sets guys up. It's an effective route running style for him. And that's great. Um, and I think effective, and I think you should stick with that a lot of the times, but from an evaluation standpoint, it is, I don't want to say frustrating, but difficult to know how much speed is really in there on the football field. And his speed grade for me, even though he ran a 4-3-4, is still going to get kind of an italics hyphenated A- minus for me. I mean, 4-3-4 speed is like A speed, and if he can unlock that, in the NFL while continuing to be the fluid route runner, the guy that can get out of, in and out of his breaks, flip his hips, stop on a dime, juke defenders. Um, I mean, we are talking about C.D. Lamb. So there are very close physical comparisons, especially now that we've seen that 40 time to a top five receiver in the NFL. And the other thing is, even though he, he doesn't have the production, Transferred away from Georgia, not the most explosive passing game. I'll put it that way. Um, But transfers to Texas where he thought it was going to be more lucrative for him and he could really emerge and show off his traits. Well, he gets to Texas and you got Xavier Worthy. You got um, Whittington, who's this big bodied slot guy that's an easy target for viewers. You have uh, um, Jatavion Sanders is a... You know, second round tight end. They loved their running backs. Jonathan Brooks is going to be a, a day two draft pick. They had a million mouths to feed. And honestly, man, for the most part, they just kind of stuck Mitchell outside, had him running hitches, had him running comebackers, outs, posts, go balls. They didn't really look his way that often. So, what I'm getting at here is he just really at no point in his career has produced much. He barely has a thousand receiving yards in his three year career. And I don't want to just write that off and, and assume that's going to be there at the next level. I obviously think it can be. I just said he could be CD Lamp, for God's sake. But I do think there's something to be said about 
a lot of times he lacks urgency to get into his routes. He's not making himself kind of presentable to the quarterback as often as he could be by by winning and separating quickly. And I also have a little bit of a knock on him in terms of working his way back to the quarterback. It's an awareness thing. It's a coaching point. But when you're a bigger bodied wide receiver and you want to develop that chemistry and trust with your quarterback, you know, you've got to basically box out the guys that are going to be playing over the top of you. And he just doesn't do that very well. He kind of lets the ball come to him. And I think over time, as Quinn Ewers is playing with this guy, you might see Mitchell stop on that hitch route, but not trust him so much. So there is something to be said about becoming the focal point of a passing game and reaching that potential and wanting the ball and urgently getting to that space that is missing with him. But I think it can be there. I don't think there's a lack of competitive uh, competitiveness with him. I don't think it's a lack of physicality. I just think it's the offense he played in and the lack of like really coaching and them bringing that out of him. So he is a really enticing wide receiver prospect like Xavier Worthy, his teammate. It's just it's difficult to find these traits. Now, I think his traits come around more consistently than like worthy and his speed but still like there wasn't a Adonai Mitchell in last year's draft class that can move like him at his size so I really think a team probably will take him in the first round and if it's the Chiefs if it's the Bills I think they might take him in the first round and steal a top 10 alpha receiver in the NFL it's it's the the concept of Adonai Mitchell is really enticing but that's why my low comp is a guy that got a lot of hype a couple years ago that just was was kind of surrounded by a lot of talent never really emerged as a super productive guy but checked the size the athleticism the movement skills but never made it work in the NFL Terrace Marshall who was effect he went very early in the second round to the Panthers um and I think there's some of that fear with Mitchell that he just doesn't quite have that it factor and overall just like call it football awareness or football instincts at the position. We'll see, man. I'm excited to see where he goes, though, and I'm definitely a fan of Adonai Mitchell's game. And one thing that got lost in that little spiel there, by the way, is this dude catches everything. Super consistent hands, amazing catch radius, body control, um, the just like the the fade touchdown he had against Washington where he's just floating in the air um 39 and a half inch vertical jump an 11 foot four inch broad jump like dude is a freak so just hope they can I guess put the dog back in him after he left Georgia Bulldogs there's some sort of play on words available there uh, but let's get to my number five wide receiver We've made it. We have not talked about Lad McConkey yet. I'm going there, guys. I'm putting Lad in my top five. I just don't see how Lad McConkey fails in the NFL. He is the best route running wide receiver I think I've ever watched. The only guy that comes close would be Jerry Judy. Um, but I think Lad McConkey is more nuanced to all three levels. I think the day he gets drafted, he's going to be to play it safe, one of the 10 best route runners in the league. Um, if not top five, the way that he dots guys up, all of these SEC corners embarrassing all of these future first and second round draft picks, um, the pacing in his routes, the foot speed, his change of direction is exceptional. His acceleration in and out of his breaks. You know, our, our guy, Mike Renner went on the Mina Kimes show and compared him to, to Antonio Brown and the way that he moves. And Antonio Brown was famous for basically being one of few humans that can accelerate while he turns that combination of change of direction and acceleration just it's it's not there in most in in 99.9 percent .9 of human beings lad mcconkey has that and guys just can't keep up with him after he's already set you up with technique and foot speed he can then accelerate away from you it's it's special stuff, man. And I wish I could show clips of it. 
but the conference that Lad McConkey plays in just doesn't want YouTubers to show NFL fans their amazing players doing amazing things on the gridiron. But just go watch a highlight reel because you won't regret it. It is an absolute treat the way Lad McConkey moves, and I think we'll be able to separate barring injury in the NFL is as big of a lock as I could tell you from this wide receiver class. I just don't know how he could possibly get to the league and NFL corners are able to stick with him. Beyond that, like he's not tiny. He's a little more slender, 186 pounds, 5'11 and a half. Arms are shorter. Hands are smaller. Um, there's some size stuff there, but he's not tiny, right? Like he's not, I mean, even Tank Dell made it work, but he's not Tank Dell's size, right? But he moves kind of like Tank Dell, honestly. It's not a bad pro comp, to be fair. Uh, Tank Dell, another guy that just moves at a different different planet. Uh, but Lad's bigger. He's like bigger Tank is, is a decent comp for him. But my comp is Deontay Johnson, who is one of the best route runners in the league. And I went with Deontay because, um, you know, it's just there's so many similarities there. Not just the fact that Deontay is a top five to 10 route runner in the league and separates in the NFL at a super high level. But, you know, he's a guy that can play inside and out. I don't think uh, McConkey is just a slot guy. I think he'll probably do his best damage from the slot. But I definitely think, I mean, he's got, you know, 439 speed. It shows on film. They put him on the outside at Georgia. He's got you know good fit speed good release um just just as the rest of his technique he can kind of bend and dip and accelerate away from press coverage didn't see a lot of press um in his role at georgia but i do think he can go go outside and win vertical as we've seen from deontay johnson but he does have smaller hands he does have drops uh he doesn't have the biggest catch radius it's all very similar to deontay johnson so i really like that comp and you're taking Deontay Johnson in the first round, even though he's dealt with some drops, he's dealt with some bad quarterback play. But um, again, I just barring injury, which might be a small question for him because he's had slight durability concerns with a, a more slender frame. But other than that, I just really don't see how Lad McConkey fails in the NFL. So I had to put him in my top five. And I've got a very close grade on Lad, for example, as I did on both Zay Flowers and um jackson smith and jigba last year so that just kind of puts this in context of the type of player that he is um and where i'd be comfortable drafting him but let's get to number four and brian thomas jr is going to be the player here this he's a very safe projection in terms of what he's going to be at the next level and i think kind of locked that in running a 433 at 6'2 210 pounds I mean, if, if you just said, you know, you're trying to teach someone about football and you wanted to show someone what a Z wide receiver deep threat in the NFL is, it's Brian Thomas. He's got the size. He's got the speed. He's got good hands. He's got good movement skills. He's not quite as fluid in terms of stopping and starting and breaking all over the field. Um, that's why I do think he's a Z, someone that you want to keep in a straight line. Um, very much the DK Metcalf role that we talked about with Xavier Leggett. Uh, he's drawn some MVS comps. He's just a much better player than, than MVS. And I comp him to the guy that the Packers replaced MVS with in Christian Watson when he's healthy. I mean, Christian Watson's um, a very good player when he's healthy. But Brian Thomas doesn't necessarily have those concerns. And he's a lot younger coming out of the LSU as opposed to North Dakota State. So... Um, definitely feel better about Brian Thomas as a prospect than I did about Watson, but um, pro comps aside, man, I mean, another guy that I just do really think will be successful if put in the right role, like we said about Lad McConkey, I just don't fully see how he fails. He's got really good release technique for a true junior. He's got a springy uh, first step that with his size and he uses his arms well he accelerates through contact like he's just a very difficult player to press that 433 speed absolutely shows on on tape he's got rare acceleration for a bigger guy and that's where that it really helps him in his release and that kind of 10 yard area i mean he had a 150 10 yard split that was um second best in the class behind 
uh, Xavier Worthy, who is a one four nine. So like he he gets off the line and goes, man. Like you pair that with the long speed and the size, some of the highlight catches he makes, the the, the catch radius he has, um, it's it's dangerous, man. Now, just like all these vertical threats, he's, he's going to deal with some drops. It's tough over the shoulder. You know, ball's not always right where you need it. You're, you're probably going to rack up some drops there. But you put this guy with the Jags with the 18th pick locked and loaded, man. Like deep balls with him and Trevor Lawrence for days. Just like we said, though, with Worthy, like put him on a team that doesn't have a quarterback that can launch the deep ball. You're not going to get the most out of him. But um, I think you, you take him in the first round any given draft class even this one and you know what you're getting and it's a very nice projection for brian thomas so uh, i i still put him at wide receiver four because it's just that that ability to win deep there's only five to ten guys that can do it at the level that i think brian thomas uh, should be able to do in the nfl but then my number three wide receiver is roma dunze and i'm gonna try to set this up without coming off like a hater it's going to be impossible, and I'm going to come off as a hater, but I'm just going to be honest. I've seen a lot of draft analysts that I respect and continue to respect, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. I hope I'm wrong. And Roma Dunze becomes the next Justin Jefferson elite wide receiver in the NFL, but I don't think it's close between Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze for the wide receiver two spot. I think Neighbors is closer to Marvin Harrison, to the number one wide receiver, than Adunze is to Brian Thomas for wide receiver four. I just, relative to where the praise on Adunze has gotten, where it's like, he should go three ahead of Malik Neighbors, or you should pass on a Joe Alt, like a franchise left tackle for this guy. If, if, if you needed both positions, people have talked about Roma Adunze, like he is going to be a game wrecking alpha wide receiver someone that can destroy you at all three levels a run after catch threat a guy that can quote unquote get you a bucket against the best corners in the nfl i just don't see the athleticism and separation from a dunze to be a justin jefferson a tyree kill an aj brown a cd lamb and I'm not saying he can't separate. I'm just saying where the discourse has gone with Odunze, I just can't quite get there with him. Now, I think he's worth a top 10 pick for sure. I think he can be a, a really high-end starter, a, a sort of one of three, if you will. Like you, If you can get an Odunze and pair him with a great deep threat and a nasty slot wide receiver, like if you could go Odunze, Deontay Johnson, and I don't know, Marquise Brown as like your three complementary groups of skill sets. Great. Love it. And spending a top 10 pick to get one of those three guys, I'm fine with that. But where the conversation's gone again, I just can't quite match that. Now, he, he by far would have been the number one wide receiver in last year's draft class. So there's some high praise for him right there. But again, I just, I just don't see the athlete there to reach an immense ceiling. Now, he is one of the best just ball skills receivers you'll ever see that's why i've got him comp to roddy white who just caught everything but roddy white eventually needed his julio jones for that receiving room to really open up but uh, uh, dunze's ability to just track the ball through traffic consistent hands to not drop the ball to elevate for the ball um, get the ball at, at the high point, not let DBs get their hands on it, toe tap at the sideline, you name it. I mean, he is right there with some of the best I've ever seen at that position. Adam Thielen comes to my mind. Um, Antonio Brown had that trait too, where it just, it didn't matter how many bodies were on him. He would somehow let the ball just like drift into his arms and find himself in the perfect position. I think Justin Jefferson does have a little bit of that. Um, in him as well so that's I mean that's such a valuable trait man and he's another one of these guys like we've talked about with Coleman and um, Johnny Wilson where get him with a really accurate quarterback that's going to trust him down the field like Michael Penix did and he's going to be lethal man but I do think that's his superpower and it requires a quarterback to get the ball to him in those situations and there are quarterbacks in the league that are 
you know, they're, they're throwers, not passers, and they want to see these guys open before they throw the ball, or they don't have the accuracy that Penix has to hit these, you know, back shoulder um, balls when, when you know, Adunze is not stacking guys vertically, but he can stop and, and get those back shoulders um, with great timing with a Michael Penix, but there's a lot of quarterbacks that can't throw that ball accurately, so... Um, he is a little bit more landing spot de- dependent too than our top two guys. That's, that's part of why there's that tier gap there. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to come off as a hater. I really am impressed by Roma Dunze's game. Um, but as we get to our top two wide receivers here, I think we're just talking about a different specimen and a different ceiling at the wide receiver position. And that's going to start with Malik Neighbors, another SEC player that I wish I could run some highlights for you. But I finished Marvin Harrison's eval, and then I finished Malik Neighbors' eval, and I, I'm i one of these people where I'm like, look, the gap's not that big, man. Malik Neighbors is the best wide receiver prospect I've evaluated in seven years, not named Marvin Harrison, and that's why I said in the intro that this could be the best wide receiver class ever. Um, the closest guy, I think, is Jamar Chase, also out of LSU, very similar to Malik Neighbors. Um, if Jamar Chase was able to play that final year, his junior year was lost to the COVID season. He opted out. Um, it was, um, I don't want to say it was a knock on on Jamar Chase, but it, it just took away that opportunity to go and have that big third year. Um, but I also think Malik, da- Malik Neighbors is very similar to Jamar Chase, but is actually a little faster. <laughs> Um, now I think Jamar Chase ball skills and ability to catch through traffic was a little better. People use that as a knock though on Malik neighbors. And I couldn't disagree more. Um, I think people are looking for a criticism of Malik neighbors because, well, he's wide receiver too. You got to have criticisms of him, Right. And you look at him and you're like, well, there's a couple reps where he, you know, got out physical to the catch point. So He's not a good contested catch receiver. And I'm like, okay, but what about the seven other times where he's mossing dudes? What about his career 50% contested catch rate that's dragged down pretty bad from it being 36% in his freshman year? He was 62% two years ago and 45% last year. Like, I've seen this dude use his size at six foot 200 and with outstretched arms, pluck the ball away from dudes and box guys out with his frame. Um, so I disagree with that as a knock. In fact, I think his catch rate is, is sensational. I was disappointed that he didn't work out because I think he could have jumped over 40 inches, put up one of those 11-foot broad jumps. And that takes me to the core reason that he is above a Dunze, and that is that athletic profile that, again, if he were to test, we're talking 4 three, five speed, and just on the field, man, like his foot speed, his acceleration – paired with honestly like really good route running ability he sets dudes up he understands pacing within his routes he can snap in and out of his breaks talk about a guy that can threaten vertical but also just stop on an absolute dime and just leave corners in the dirt before they even realize that he stopped and turned um and that ability working in tandem with him as a vertical threat it's it's just different um his run after catch ability is also probably second best in class to Malachi Corley. Um, But even neighbors, it's like he can make a couple guys miss, and then he also has the speed to just pull away from dudes. And that's where the kind of Jamar Chase and DJ Moore comps really come in because those are two of the best run-after-catch receivers in the league. So you go through the whole profile, literally what does this guy not have? He's got the athleticism all across the board, not just speed, but change of direction, lateral agility, amazing ball skills, amazing run after catch, great route runner, incredible production. Dude's special. So I'll I'll end on neighbors uh, with a point I made in one of my mock drafts. He is no consolation prize to our number one wide receiver here. And I wouldn't be stunned if neighbors actually over time maybe was even the better player. In fact, I have a higher potential grade on neighbors than I do Marvin Harrison, the number one wide receiver. Um, I even know of people that have neighbors um, ahead of Marvin because of that athletic difference. And uh, 
Harrison is almost like if you just took everything we said about Adunze and Neighbors, um, athletically speaking, and just met in the middle. Uh, like, I don't think Marvin is as special of an athlete as Neighbors, but I do think he's faster and moves a little better than Adunze. And he's also the tallest of the three. He's uh, about a half a foot taller than Adunze. But this is the most polished wide receiver I've ever seen. And I, I don't know how long we're going to wait until we see another guy as, as polished and complete and as close to a sure thing at the wide receiver position as Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, clearly has the bloodlines, has spent his whole life training to be a professional wide receiver, and it shows. Like, let's just start with the route running. Like, the nuance that he understands, it shows up in his release package, which is one of the best I've ever seen. He already has, like, three or four different release packages that he can go to. It's just unfair for these college corners trying to press this dude because he looks like Devontae Adams at the line, just like the foot speed and the inside outside releases, the speed releases, the delayed releases, you name it. It's it's crazy. But then he gets down the field and you can see he understands that sort of advanced timing in his routes that he doesn't always have to run at full speed. Um, but when he needs to, he'll unhook the plow and really accelerate into his brakes as well. He can stop on a dime. Uh, then you get to his ball skills. Did have some drops show up this year. It was really in one game, the Purdue game. He had three of his seven career drops in the Purdue game alone. So he got in his head a little bit in that game, but you throw that one out, he's got super, con super consistent hands, some of the best body control, contested catch ability. Talk about everything we said about Adunze, copy and paste to Marvin Harrison whether there's bodies on him, whether he's got to contort his body and make him a weird over-the-shoulder catch, whether it's trying to keep both feet in on the sideline, whatever it is, his ability to catch the ball through traffic is creme de la creme. Um, the catch radius, he'll high point the, boy, the ball, he can jump, unbelievable. And he blocks, he's a good run blocker. Um, clearly that's been you know, kind of put into him is, is you got to be able to block in the NFL. He's like, all right, no problem. I'm 6'3", 210. Shouldn't be too big of a deal against these corners. Um, and then even this final year against Ohio State uh, showed better. Like going into the year, the one question was like, is he good at with the ball in his hands after the catch? And in his final year at Ohio State, he like really showed an uptick in making guys miss, being a screen threat, um, you know, kind of, kind of like catching that slant and showing that spin move to the outside. Uh, just, I mean, dude, it's it's wild. So we had to rave about him, but you knew what it was. It's, it, it, it is Marvin. It's always been Marvin, and uh, he's going to be an absolute get for somebody. He is, I, I will, I guess, end on this banger. He's the highest graded non-running back that I've had since I've done this. Running back, obviously, a position that... Um, We've seen these guys come in with a really high floor. I think we've seen more of that from these wide receivers, but this is the highest floor wide receiver I've I've ever seen. Barring injury, we are talking about a likely perennial Pro Bowl caliber player. I haven't comped to A.J. Green. Some people have said that's disrespectful. No, you, sir, are being disrespectful to how amazing A.J. Green was. Um, was the number four overall pick out of Georgia and kicked ass with Andy Dalton for almost a whole decade. So, um I think if he has better health, Marvin Harrison can have a better career than A.J. Green. But in terms of at the peak of his powers, I see a very similar player. And uh, we're going to send it out on that note. Um, thank you so much for watching. I know this got long, but I think you guys are going to enjoy the length. I wanted to do 15 players because this class is special, man. But if you want my opinions on even more wide receivers, there's still some fascinating names that we, we didn't talk about. Guys like Tez Walker. Javon Baker, Jalen Polk. I mean, the list just keeps going in this draft. If you want my grades, my write-ups, you name it, on all those players, check out my draft board over on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash that franchise guy. If nothing else, please do hit that like button on the way out. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the rest of these positional breakdowns. They won't all be this long, uh, but we'll see you guys for the next one. I think we're going to do edge rushers next. So we have that to look forward to. And... That'll be in about a week. So we'll see you guys then. I'm back to the film until I see you guys for the next video. Peace out. <laughs>